The objective of this video is to introduce a forthcoming book on a new interpretation of quantum mechanics. It's a um, so-called realist interpretation of quantum mechanics. And it's referred to as the Zitterbewegung interpretation. The interpretation is not all that new, actually. Uh, Zitter or Zitterbewegung is German. It's a term that was coined by the founding father of wave mechanics, the Austrian scientist Erwin Schrödinger. Zitter means shaking or trembling, literally. It refers to a very local and very small scale oscillation of the electron. It's a theoretical consequence of Dirac's equation for an electron. We believe it's not only theoretical, we believe it's real, and uh, it explains a lot of things that the mainstream interpretation of quantum mechanics, the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, cannot explain. What's new in this book is that we're going to apply the basic ideas and principles of this interpretation to all of quantum mechanics. We're not only going to talk electrons, but photons as well, and uh, interactions. It is a realist interpretation of quantum mechanics because it believes the wave function does actually represent the elementary particle that we are looking at. The Zitterbewegung interpretation allows us to integrate the wave and particle-like character of, well, particles or wavicles or whatever you want to call them. An electron is a point-like charge, but it's always in some motion, a local circular motion. That's the basic idea, and it's the energy in that motion that explains its mass. As such, the whole idea embodies John Wheeler's idea of mass without mass, an idea which he introduced in the early 1960s. As for the Zitterbewegung interpretation itself, I must credit David Hestenes, who is 85 now, um, with reviving the whole idea back in the 1980s. Let me briefly introduce John Wheeler's idea, mass without mass, because it's a bit of a backbone of the whole approach. You know the Greek uh, proverb, pantare, everything flows, everything is motion. That's basically what Newton's law tells us. Look at it. The formula is there. A force is really that what changes the state of motion of an object. If you look at Newton's law, you can see that mass appears as a proportionality factor. Newton's force law tells us that mass is nothing but a measure of inertia. It's a resistance to a change of the state of motion of an object. Hence, when we choose a natural unit to measure force, we also choose a natural unit to measure mass. So we also have Einstein's mass-energy equivalence relation. That's something that emerges from relativity theory. He tells us that, well, that energy and mass are equivalent. Equivalent, um, that's not the same, but they're equivalent. Mass and energy differ basically because of a proportionality factor as well, c squared. That's not a mathematical constant like p or Euler's number e. It's a physical constant. So it's a constant, but it has a physical dimension. To be precise, it's 299,792,458 meter per second squared. Exactly. It's a funny thing. I like to write Einstein's mass energy equivalence like I do in that red box. The ratio between the energy and the mass of any particle, an electron, a proton, a photon, any particle really, is always the same. C squared. Why is that so? That mass energy equivalence tells me that if we can understand mass in terms of motion, then somehow we should be able to understand energy in terms of motion too. That was actually John Wheeler's basic instinct when he coined that term, mass without mass. There's energy in an oscillation, and energy has an equivalent mass. So we should understand mass 
in terms of the energy of some oscillation, perhaps. That oscillation may be electromagnetic or gravitational or whatever. It's some force per unit. Well, per unit charge, if we're thinking of the electromagnetic force. An oscillating field, a force per unit something, some charge. Electric charge, plus or minus, or when thinking of what's going on in the nucleus, some color-coded charge, perhaps. Color television instead of black and white only. In any case, the force laws, or force laws, I should say plural, are very fundamental. If we understand the forces, we understand everything in physics. When calculating the energy in some oscillation, we are going to integrate a force over some distance, obviously. So we're going to find that the energy is proportional to the square of the amplitude of the oscillation. That's because we're integrating. We have a linear force, we're integrating, so we get a square. The electromagnetic force depends linearly on the distance, just like the gravitational force. That's why we get a square function. That linearity is important. We don't have linear forces inside of the nucleus itself. When talking quarks and gluons and all that, those forces are nonlinear, so their analysis is a very different ballgame. That's why we're going to limit ourselves to electrons and photons here in this presentation and their interactions. So we'll actually only be discussing the so-called QED sector of quantum physics in our book, Quantum Electrodynamics. Everything that's explained by the electromagnetic force, which is quite a lot. We can think of the consequences of our interpretation of QED for other sectors in the standard model, notably QCD, but we'll do that later. Nonlinearity is tough, so we won't deal with that right now. So let's think of some electromagnetic oscillation. Its energy is going to be proportional to the square of the amplitude, and because the force is linear, it's also going to be proportional to the square of the frequency which we can express in oscillations per second, or as we're going to do, um, as an angular frequency. If you don't thoroughly understand what an angular frequency actually is, you should look it up. Otherwise, you won't understand much of what I'm going to present. Are there any other variables besides amplitude and frequency we can think of? Maybe not. So we can say that the energy of an oscillation is proportional to the square of its amplitude and the square of its frequency. So the question we now need to answer is, what's the uh, proportionality factor? Because if we can find that proportionality factor, we have an equation for the energy in, well, an oscillation. I'm going to write that proportionality factor as m. It's the same symbol we used for the mass of some object. It's a lot worse, actually. I'm going to boldly assume that the proportionality factor is the mass. I've got good reasons for that, which I'll explain later. So for now, it looks a bit outrageous, but we'll get there. By now, there, there are actually two possibilities. Either you're switched on, you're enthusiastic about this, or else you've switched off and you think this is nonsense. It sounds a bit nuts, right? If you're switched on, you might make it through the whole presentation. I surely hope so. If not, then well, <laughs> then you surely won't. Um, let me show you something that you'll understand intuitively. Look at a diagram. Think of that green dot going around as some point-like charge. So it's going around and around in a circular motion at some constant velocity v, tangential velocity. That tangential velocity will be equal to the radius of its circular motion and the angular frequency. That's just a very basic math formula. So, while looking at that formula for the tangential velocity and our condition to sort of equate that, you know, energy formula for an oscillation and Einstein's mass energy equivalence relation, it's really the same. It's the product of, you know, the radius and an angular frequency. So if we can somehow interpret the speed of light as some tangential velocity, then this weird equation on top of our slide makes sense. That's actually the whole theta bewegung model. It's all there. We're really thinking of some point light charge, an electric charge only, with no mechanical mass that's going round and round at the speed of light. 
So that circular motion is the oscillation. And the equivalent mass of that energy is the rest mass of our electron. You'll probably need some time to digest that idea. But, um, well, we don't have the whole day, so I need to move on. So that's what I'll do. Make sure you don't watch this presentation on a smartphone. You need a large computer screen. There's going to be formulas and a fair amount of text also, and you won't be able to read this from your smartphone. You've seen also maybe that red and blue there in the diagram. Um, it's part of a sine and a cosine function. We will show that we can think of the circular motion as the superposition of two independent linear oscillations. 90 degrees out of phase and perpendicular one to another, but with the same frequency and the same amplitude. So it's just a sine and a cosine indeed. Looks a bit complicated initially, but you'll see it all falls into place, which is why I'm very excited about this interpretation of quantum physics and uh, the whole thing. Okay, let's go for it. Um, first, I should probably remind you why we, why we need a new interpretation of quantum physics. It's because we really want to understand what's going on. We want to be able to sort of visualize what an electron or a photon actually is and what happens when they interact. Such understanding is necessarily an understanding in terms of space and time. And I'm talking three-dimensional physical space here, not some weird n-dimensional mathematical space. We will want to understand things in terms of some pattern of motion. That's just how our mind works. That's how we visualize things, how we form a mental picture. Paul Dirac, in his introduction to the principle of quantum mechanics, said that's not possible. That's actually what the mainstream Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics tells us. What actually happens, happens in some sort of black box and we can't open that box. The rather famous Richard Feynman said the same. Let me read it out. Nature's fundamental laws do not govern the world as it appears in our mental picture in any very direct way. Instead, they control a substratum of which we cannot form a mental picture without introducing irrelevancies. The formulation of these laws requires the use of the mathematics of transformation. That's Dirac. Feynman said, because atomic behavior is so unlike ordinary experience, it's very difficult to get used to, and it appears peculiar and mysterious to everyone, both to the novice and to the experienced physicist. Even the experts do not understand it the way they would like to, and it's perfectly reasonable that they should not, because all of direct human experience and of human intuition applies to large objects. We know how large objects will act, but things on a small scale just do not act that way. So we have to learn about them in some sort of abstract or imaginative fashion and not by connection with our direct experience. That's very frustrating. So, well, that's it, a bewaking interpretation. Um, it's different. It allows us to understand things the way we would like to understand them. We should also remind ourselves why we need actually a quantum theory. Why is classical mechanics not working? Um, the, main, the main reason, of course, is wave-particle duality. Um, I'll just go Dirac once again here, who basically observed photons, electrons, all particles have wave properties, which can be exhibited under suitable conditions. It's a very striking and general example of the breakdown of classical mechanics, not merely an inaccuracy in its laws of motion, but an inequality of its concepts to supply us with a description of atomic or subatomic events. We also have this weird physical constant that pops up at the atomic and subatomic scale, Planck's constant. The Planck-Einstein relation uh, relates it to an energy and a frequency. Hmm. The idea of an oscillation again, I guess is the energy and the frequency of our wavicle, obviously, but if there's a frequency, then there's going to be an oscillation. What oscillation are we talking about? We also have the de Broglie relation, which relates momentum and some wavelength. Again, you wonder, what's the wavelength of a particle? 
And well, if we have a frequency f, then we have a cycle time t. Cycle time is just the inverse of f. If we have, say, 10 oscillations per second, then the cycle time will be one tenth of a second. Hence, the Planck Einstein relation can be rewritten. It says basically, when we rewrite it, that the product of the energy and the cycle time should be equal to Planck's constant. Likewise, we can also rewrite the Broglie relation. The product of the momentum and the wavelength of a particle should be equal to Planck's constant. That's really a funny equation. What's the nature of that age of Planck's quantum of action? We, of course, have also associated expressions of the uncertainty principle, complementary expressions, I would say. You can see them there. But again, the question is really, what is that cycle time? What is that oscillation? Because if we can't answer that question, we can't sort of say much more about what the uncertainty in them would be. So the Copenhagen interpretation interpretation does not give us any answer really to such questions. The Zitterbewegung interpretation does. We also have these weird symmetries, as you know, the wave function of all matter particles, think of electrons, fermions, has a 720 degree symmetry in space. That's because of that one over two factor in the transformation rules those mathematics of transformation, as Dirac called it. Now, real-life objects in three-dimensional space, no matter how weird their shape might be, have a 360-degree symmetry in space. You may have seen those videos of professors demonstrating Dirac's bell trick or the cup trick. They're all supposed to show that real objects can actually have 720-degree symmetries, but they're rubbish. The hand and arm that holds the cup or turns that belt is firmly attached to the person that does the trick. And so that introduces some unacceptable, unacceptable for me at least, relation between the object and its space around it. It frames the object. It's not a real 720 degree symmetry. In contrast, patterns of motion can have 720 degree symmetries, a rotation within the rotation, for example. A pattern of motion can have any symmetry, really. So physicists and mathematicians have developed weird mathematical objects, spinors, for example, or spinners, as they're also called, to deal with these. But we lost relevance. We do not know if a spinner actually represents something real. So just said, patterns of motion can have any symmetry. Think of rotations within rotations, indeed. But we believe that at some basic level, we must find something we can imagine in three-dimensional space. The Zitterbewegung interpretation gives us a Hibbert description. It combines the idea of motion with the idea of a point-like particle. The mainstream interpretation of quantum physics made all great physicists unhappy, including the founding fathers of quantum mechanics, Schrödinger and Dirac, for example. Einstein famously said that God doesn't play dice. He actually wasn't worried about the conclusion that nature was probabilistic, but he wanted to see some theory that could reasonably explain the probabilities. Uncertainty and unpredictability are not the same. Things can be deterministic, but they can still be unpredictable if we don't know the initial conditions, for example. I could insert an image of a, a fast spinning propeller of an airplane here. We know that at any point in time, it's going to be somewhere, but it's moving so fast, we can't really say where it is right now. We'll prefer to give some probability based on the size and the speed of the propeller and the space it covers, based on some mass or energy density, in other words. John Stuart Bell, a third generation quantum theorist, developed a no-go theorem that proves that no explanation in terms of hidden variables is possible. However, that theorem is only as good as its assumptions. Bell himself was always exploring other theories and said he hoped that one day some radical conceptual renewal would disprove his own theorem. Even the great Dirac was unhappy about the theory he had helped to develop near the end of his life, 
he wrote the following. These rules of renormalization give surprisingly excessively good agreement with experiments. Most physicists say that these working rules are therefore correct. I feel that's not an adequate reason. Just because the results happen to be in agreement with observation does not prove that one's theory is correct. He wrote it in 1984, said just before he died. It's crazy, right? This guy got a Nobel Prize for his theories. They work. Everybody thinks they're great. But he himself says it must be rubbish. And it's not only Dirac, Schrödinger, Pauli, even Heisenberg felt something was rotten about it. These guys got Nobel Prizes for a theory they thought wasn't okay. They thought of it as a temporary procedural theory. Not something that really explains stuff. When everything is said and done, we might say that quantum electrodynamics is a theory of electrons and photons, but it actually lacks a good description of what electrons and photons actually are. The Zitterbewegung interpretation of quantum mechanics gives us an answer to that question. It is the radical conceptual renewal that John Stuart Bell was waiting for. So, where's the error? Thomas Aquinas starts his De Ente et Essentia by quoting Aristotle's. A small error in the beginning can lead to great errors in the conclusion. I think I haven't covered that small error. We fail to use a degree of freedom in the mathematical description. Quantum physicists will tell you they don't really think of the elementary wave function as representing anything real, but in fact they do. Of course they do. And if you insist, they will tell you rather reluctantly, because they're not so sure about what is what, that it might represent some theoretical spin zero particle. Now, we all know spin zero particles do not exist. All real particles, electrons, photons, anything, have spin. And spin, which is a shorthand for angular momentum, is always in one direction or the other. It's just the magnitude of the spin that differs. It is therefore completely odd that the plus or the minus sign of the imaginary unit is not being used to include the spin direction in the mathematical description. If we would do that, those weird 720 degree symmetries disappear. The argument is a bit complicated, but in one of my papers, I've really shown that's the case it removes the single most important argument against a realist interpretation of the wave function. If you want to check it out, you can find my papers on Phil Gibbs' site. I published them there because mainstream journals do not really like that stuff. At the bottom I put a quote from uh, an MIT course on quantum mechanics that, that proves my point. See, both. Um, the wave function with a plus or a minus are seen as acceptable waveforms for a particle that is propagating in a given direction. So we've got two mathematical possibilities to model you know, one physical possibility. So they say the choice is just a matter of convention and that fortunately most physicists use the same convention. That's weird. Why do we not exploit that mathematical degree of freedom. We've got a language here and, um, you know, it's not unambiguous. It should be. We're talking science. It's really just um, Occam's razor principle. If we have two good theories, we should choose the one which is simplest. It's the principle of mathematical parsimony. Mathematicians may not like the expression in the upper right-hand corner of this slide. Both expressions are equal to minus one, right? Well, maybe not. It should make sense to physicists. When going from here to there, it matters how you get there. Feynman's proof of those 720 degree symmetries of those asymmetric wave functions is based on the assumption 
that minus 1 is just a common phase factor. If we multiply a set of amplitudes, probability amplitudes, think of two amplitudes to be specific, like in a beam splitter or the double split experiment. If we multiply them with minus 1, we get the same states all over again. So he says, but it's not true. We should think of minus 1 as a complex number itself. The phase factor may be plus or minus pi. These are two distinct possibilities. Feynman's proof is based on a mathematical convention, which leads to a false assumption. If we simplify the mathematical description by ensuring all mathematical degrees of freedom in the description correspond to all physical degrees of freedom in the physical system we are trying to describe, then those weird symmetries vanish. We get a common sense description of the world again in terms of time and three-dimensional space. It's the Sitte-Bewegung interpretation of quantum mechanics. The Sitte-Bewegung interpretation of quantum mechanics goes back to the founding fathers. Dirac's formidable brain produced the Dirac equation for an electron. It's a complicated differential equation, which I'm not going to try to explain here. Schrodinger immediately found a rather trivial but special solution for it. The electron just going round and round at speed of light in an exceedingly small orbit, an orbit whose scale was that of the quantum wavelength. Dirac was intrigued about it, and he talks about Schrödinger's discovery in his Nobel Prize lecture, a Nobel Prize he shared with Schrödinger, by the way, in 1933. He said the following about it. The variables give rise to some rather unexpected phenomena concerning the motion of the electron. These have been fully worked out by Schrödinger. It is found that an electron, which seems to us to be moving slowly, must actually have a very high frequency oscillatory motion of small amplitude superposed on the regular motion which appears to us. As a result of this oscillatory motion, the velocity of the electron at any time equals the velocity of light. This is a prediction which cannot be directly verified by experiments since the frequency of the oscillatory motion is so high and its amplitude is so small. However, one must believe in this consequence of the theory, since other consequences of the theory are inseparably bound up with this one, such as the law of scattering of light by an electron. They are confirmed by experiment. If you understand anything of this presentation, then you're probably quite familiar with Compton scattering. The Compton scattering radius is, for all practical purposes, the effective radius of an electron. A photon may be absorbed, and then an emission of a photon with some lower frequency, lower energy, that is, may follow. The difference in energy is absorbed by the electron. Its kinetic energy will change. Its velocity may change. We won't get into the nitty-gritty here. But just know that Schrödinger's discovery made sense to Dirac. The radius of that theoretical circular motion and the electron's photon scattering radius are the same. For some reason, no one followed up, not even Dirac, which is rather strange in light of his later remarks on the, on the inadequacies of quantum theory. However, David Hessner's revived the idea in the 1980s, and he got some worthy followers who further developed the idea. There are various interpretations of the interpretation, however. I think of them as being complementary to each other. Heston's interpretation of the Zitterbewegung, which is what you see here, is that of a current ring, literally a perpetual loop of electric current. A perpetual loop of current is not weird at all. It actually naturally occurs in zero resistance conductors. When you have some magnetic field, the B0 field in the left-hand side of the illustration here, going through a ring made of superconducting material, we can cool the ring below the critical temperature and switch off the field. Lenz's law, which is nothing but a consequence of Faraday's law of induction, then tells us the change in the magnetic field will induce an electromotive force. Hence, we get an induced electric current. 
and its direction and magnitude will be such that the magnetic flux in it, it the magnetic flux it generates will compensate for the flux change due to the change in the applied field. This may sound very complicated, but it's just a logical consequence of Maxwell's equation. Heston has summarized his Zitterbewegung interpretation of an electron like this. The electron is nature's most fundamental superconducting current loop. The electron spin designates the orientation of the loop in space. The electron loop is just a superconducting LC circuit. The mass of the electron is the energy in the electron's electromagnetic field. Half of it is magnetic potential energy and half is kinetic. Note that a point like charge that's going around and around is just a charge. It's an electric charge and it's an electric charge only. It has no mechanical mass. It has zero rest mass if you prefer that expression. That's why its velocity equals the speed of light. However, a point like does not necessarily mean it's got no dimension whatsoever. Besides a quantum radius, an electron also has a so-called Thomson radius. That's a much smaller scale. Um, it also comes out of photon scattering experiments, but there's no interaction, no absorption or re-emission here, no interference, so to speak. The photon just bounces off with the same energy, the same frequency. The electron's kinetic energy doesn't change. That's why the ring here has some diameter. The quantum radius and the Thomson radius are related to one another through the fine structure constant. but I can't get too much into the nitty-gritty here. The book, the book does that. The uh, eminent Russian physicist Alexander Burinsky wrote me the following on Heston's interpretation. I know many people who consider the electron as a toroidal photon and do it up to now. I also started from this model about 1969 and I published an article in, well, that's a Russian journal there, in 1974. Microgeons with spin. Editor Lifshitz prohibited me then to write there about Zitterbewegung. I understand it's because of ideological reasons at the time. But there's a remnant on this notion. However, there was also this key problem. What keeps that point-like charge in its circular orbit? Indeed, the current in a superconducting ring is a current in a superconducting ring. It's made of a superconducting material. In free space, the point-like electric charge should just spin away. Some force is needed to keep it in its orbit. That's why I prefer to think of the Zitterbewegung as a two-dimensional oscillation rather than as a perpetual current ring. In fact, that's one of the key innovations, one of the key ideas in the book. Let me explain what I'm thinking of. I have a metaphor on this slide, a V2 engine. There are two cylinders there, two oscillators. Could be two springs, but I like engines. They're in a 90 degree angle and they're also oscillating 90 degrees out of phase, or they're independent. We can therefore add their energies. Any, oscilla any oscillator will have kinetic energy. Think of a mass on a spring going up and down. So, well, it's at maximum velocity when it passes the zero point. So its kinetic energy will reach a maximum then, but in contrast, it will have zero potential energy because the spring itself is at its zero point. That's what's shown in, in the graph there. The potential and kinetic energy vary, but their sum is always constant. You can see the formulas there. The energy in one oscillator will be equal to the product of the mass, the square of the amplitude, and the square of the angular frequency, divided by two. However, if we have two independent oscillations, we can just add their energies. They work in tandem, and the one over two factor vanishes. That's the formula I wrote down already. It resembles Einstein's mass energy equivalence formula. The ratio of the energy and the mass is the square of, well, Something is the square of the speed of light for any particle. This probably all sounds rather weird, so let me just go through the math and give you the, um, the grand result. 
Here it is. When you have rotational motion, the tangential velocity is equal to the radius of that rotation and the angular frequency. In this case, the tangential velocity is the speed of light. The mass of the electron is in the oscillation itself. It's not in the point-like charge. It's Wheeler's idea of mass without mass. The mass is the equivalent mass of the energy of the oscillation. The angular frequency is given by the Planck-Einstein relation. The frequency is the energy divided by Planck's constant. So we can combine the three equations, Einstein's mass energy equivalence, E is mc squared, that formula for the tangential velocity, and the Planck-Einstein relation. And then we get the Quantum radius of the electron. We have an exceedingly simple theoretical explanation for an empirical, empirical result here. It's beautiful. The illustration underneath shows the idealized theta motion when our electron moves. That circular motion becomes a spiral, an Archimedes screw to be precise. We can define another concept of wavelength here, that lambda between two successive loops. We'll come back to that. You may think it's the de Broglie wavelength, but it's not. It's related though. We'll come back to that. This slide just shows how that theta motion can be related to Euler's function, to the wave function. The two-dimensional oscillation, that circular motion, is the superposition of a sine and a cosine. We just need to put a coefficient in front. That coefficient, a, is just the radius of the oscillation. The radius of the circle of that physical motion. The theta bewegung of the point-like charge. Perhaps I should pause here, but while I actually just got started, all of the above is just an introduction. We need to generalize. What if our electron moves at higher speeds? It's perhaps not very relevant because the classical velocity of an electron in an atomic orbital, for example, is non-relativistic. It's a fraction of the speed of light. Our Zitterbewege model calculates that velocity exactly, but I can't cram everything into slides here. But but still, it's interesting to analyze what happens when the linear velocity of an electron becomes a significant fraction of the speed of light. The tangential velocity of the point light charge remains what it is. It's the velocity of light itself. It's the toroidal photon, as Burinsky calls it. Somewhat misleadingly, I find, but it is what it is. Hence, if there's a linear component, the radius of that circular motion must decrease. That's what's shown here. It's now quite easy to calculate that other wavelength, that, that lambda in the illustration, the distance between successive loops. It turns out it's a fraction of the Quantum wavelength. What fraction? Well, it's the relative velocity. It's V over C. It's an interesting analysis because if V goes to C, if that fraction goes to 1, our toroidal photon, that point-like charge whizzing around, becomes like a light photon. But that's something I analyze in the book. This presentation has become too long already and we're still not done. So, well, okay, what's next? Well, this sort of continues that relativistic analysis. We have three interrelated concepts here, three wavelengths, so to speak. The Quantum wavelength, that distance between successive loops, lambda, and then the De Broglie wavelength itself, for which we get well, the formula you see here. I also graphed it. When the electron, that hybrid thing, the point-like charge in its circular motion, is stationary, when there is no linear velocity, then the de Broglie wavelength is infinitely large. It goes down to zero as the electron progressively, very progressively, picks up linear speed. It's a strange curve. But don't worry about it. I'm just introducing it here because I want to show something else, something that's much more important. We have these three lengths. We call them wavelengths, but you know they're just lengths. 
characterizing some wave shape. They're not independent. The formulas become amazingly simple when using natural units. So when we choose a distance, time, and force or mass units, so that the numerical value of h and c are both equal to one. You can see that here. The Quantum wavelength is just the inverse of the mass of the electron measured in its natural unit. The distance between two loops can be calculated by multiplying it with the relative velocity beta, which is the number between 0 and 1. And look at the product of that length and the de Broglie wavelength. It's the inverse of the square of the mass of our electron. The three lengths define an ellipsoid. The formula at the bottom is really nothing but the Latus rectum formula of an epsiloid. By now, you're probably totally bored and you'll say, why would this matter? Well, it feeds into the analysis of the anomalous magnetic moment. You've heard about that, right? We have these theoretical values for various properties of an electronic, of an electron including its uh, geromagnetic ratio, the G ratio, as they call it. You see that at the bottom of all these formulas here. The G ratio is the ratio of, well, it's magnetic moment and its angular momentum. We have two theoretical values. One for a spin-only electron. Think of our point-like charge just spinning around. The electron is just somewhere in space, no linear velocity. And we have one when it's in some orbit, an orbital electron. Think of our electron effectively spinning around some nucleus. For a spin-only electron, the G ratio will be 2. For an orbital electron, it will be 1. We get those values really out of our Tittebewegen model. You don't get them out of the traditional Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics. Now, these values and these theoretical values are not a problem. The point is actually that experiments show that the G ratio of an actual electron is never exactly one, nor is it exactly two. That shouldn't surprise us, of course. We should expect that a real electron sort of, well, combines both, right? We have some classical coupling between the spin and the orbital moment and the magnetic moments that are associated with it. But there's actually more to it. Those three wavelengths that I introduced, those three lengths that introduce some asymmetry in the shape, the form of an electron, play a role as well. Our electron is not an exact disk, and it's surely not an exact sphere. All these elements combine to give us an alternative explanation for the anomalous magnetic moment. Alternative to what? Well, alternative to the explanation we get out of quantum field theory. Again, I don't want to get into the nitty gritty, that's for the book, but the anomalous magnetic moment is usually referred to as the high precision test of quantum mechanics. Its value is measured empirically in a wonderful mechanical device, a penning trap. That penning trap captures the electron in an electromagnetic field, but its motion is really very complicated. It's the superposition of three or four motions induced by the electric and magnetic fields in the trap. Those motions are shown in the diagram here. So, well, we can measure it. We get some empirical value. And now we need to sort of map a theory to that, right? Theoretical predictions of its value use three or four loop finite diagrams, which incorporate all of the weirdness of mainstream quantum theory. And those theoretical predictions do match that empirical value. This campaign to refine measurements and theoretical calculations has been going on for decades now. Someone called it a tennis match between experiment and theory, and it seems to be a tennis match without end. The question is, is there another game in town? We think there is. It's just a classical explanation based on our Titterbewegen interpretation of what an electron might actually be. It's the litmus test of the model, really. It's a testable prediction. If we can show that so-called anomalous magnetic moment is not anomalous at all, then, well, then our interpretation wins.
Burinsky is currently working really hard on this. He already has a first order approximation, which involves the fine structure constant. It's the fine structure constant divided by 2 pi, actually, that explains 99.85% of the anomalous magnetic moment already. We're confident he'll find a logical explanation for the remaining 0.15% of this so-called anomaly. I think that 0.15% must be some relativistic effect or some classical coupling between the various layers of motion in that penning trap. If Burinsky gets the job done, he should get a Nobel Prize for physics, I think. Okay, what's next? Well, of course, the Tsitabu wiggle interpretation needs also to explain the more mundane experiments like interference and diffraction. And, um, well, the hybrid model does that. Some Italian research groups, like the one mentioned here, Fraboni, Emilia, Gazzari, and Pozzi, have made a lot of headway here. The illustration is taken from more popular accounts of their experiments, and it's quite general. It just shows how a wave shape a plane wave in this case gets distorted as it's forced through a slit or some other filter. Its shape becomes cylindrical or spherical, it just depends on you know, the type of barrier or slit it's being forced through. The hybrid Citibe Wagon model is compatible with such explanations. There is no need for an analysis in terms of translational states or imaginary amplitudes. We're just analyzing real waves here. Of course, a lot of nitty-gritty remains to be done. We need to get the Fresnel equations out of our interpretation, and we're not quite there yet, but I can see it happen. There are smarter people than me working on these things, so while well, I think it will happen. Onwards. Oh, we have uncertainty, of course. How do we look at that? Well. The plane of that circular oscillation doesn't need to be perpendicular to the direction of motion. In fact, why would it be? It could be parallel, as in the illustration on the right-hand side, or it could just be wobbling around, wobbling about. In fact, it's probably wobbling about. We'll have precession of the magnetic moment anyway, as soon as there's some external magnetic field, like in a stern garlic experiment. Anything is possible, really, and that's where the uncertainty kicks in. It would take us too long to explain what we're thinking of here. We devote more attention to that in the book, but we actually like to think of Planck's quantum of action as a vector quantity, something that has a magnitude and a direction. Why? Well, I would say why not? Momentum is a vector quantity, right? Hence, the de Broglie relation tells us Planck's quantum of action should probably also be thought of as some vector quantity. It's kind of frustrating, but um, I have to rush a bit here. Perhaps I should split this presentation in several blocks. I probably will in due time, but now I need to move on. Unfortunately, I can only hope you see the potential, the theoretical richness in this thing. This is something important too. The Zitterbewegung interpretation of quantum mechanics provides a logical explanation for the quantization of angular momentum. It's just a logical result of the interpretation of Planck's quantum of action as representing an elementary cycle. I note some things on that here. Let me quickly go over it. We have h there. We can write it as the product of some momentum, Newton seconds, and some intervalent space expressed in meter. We can also write it as the product of some energy, Euler's and some time interval expressed in seconds or whatever equivalent time unit you want one to choose. This explains these two complementary expressions of the uncertainty principle. H is the product of the uncertainty in the momentum times some uncertainty in that space interval. And it's also equal to you know, an uncertainty in energy and an uncertainty in some time. We can also just, of course, write it as, you know, the way its physical dimension shows us. It's a product of a force. We think of that force as the force that's keeping the point-like charge in its Zitterbewegung orbit, a length, the Zitterbewegung circumference, and three, the cycle time. The physical dimension is Newton meter second, a force times a distance times time. 
That's the dimension of angular momentum. It's also the dimension of, well, action. That's a poorly understood physical quantity. In German, it's referred to as a Wirkung. The English translation, physical action, doesn't quite catch that meaning, I think. But, well, we just have to make do with it. It's usually denoted by S, capital S. For angular momentum, we'll usually write L, capital L. So we have the following equations for an electron. The action is the force times that wavelength, circumference basically, times a cycle time. And its angular momentum is its moment of inertia times the angular frequency. Now look at the meaning of Planck's quantum of action here. If we say the amount of physical action is equal to h, well, it's really the amount of physical action we should associate with one cycle of this zeta bewegung oscillation. We have the force times lambda times that cycle time. Energy is a force over some distance. So the force is the energy divided by the distance. The cycle time is the inverse of the frequency. So the whole expression simplifies to what you see here. The amount of physical action is equal to h. We get Planck's constant, the quantum of physical action. You may shrug your shoulders and say, what about it? It is a very fundamental idea, though. The formula above gives us a physical interpretation of Planck's constant. Planck's quantum of action is the physical action that's associated with what we now refer to as an elementary cycle. What do we get for the angular momentum? Well, let's, let's write it all out. The um, moment of inertia is going to be, you know, m times a squared divided by 2. That's sort of, um, yeah, the moment of inertia for, you know, a disk-like structure. That's where the factor 1 over 2 comes out. We think the mass of our electron is, you know, spread out over that disk because we have that two-dimensional oscillation. The electron occupies its space. Then we have the angular frequency, which is the tangential velocity divided by the radius. And um, as you can see, it all simplifies to what's written there, the reduced Planck constant divided by 2 which is what it should be, because an electron is a spin one two particle, spin one half particle. The beauty about this thing is that, you know, the angular momentum of an electron appears here as, well, something that we really get out of the model. There is no hocus pocus here. There is no obscure intrinsic property of an equally obscure point-like particle. We have a disk-like structure and there's a torque on it and so we've got angular momentum and we work everything out and we get the values that you know we should be getting we can explain the magnetic moment which is equally mysterious according to the copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics in a similarly classic explanation Relax, we're almost there. I just want to show these two tables now. We can easily extend the idea of the integrity of a cycle to electron orbitals. So we get a sort of augmented bohr rutherford model. All of the variables you see here, radii, velocities, frequencies, angular momenta, magnetic moments, G ratios, and so on, get an actual physical interpretation. And we get their values out of our interpretation from very straightforward calculations. So, well, that's it, actually. Well, and then it isn't. The book has a lot more. Um, I sort of could talk for hours, but this is sort of the um, contents of the book. Um, if you go over it, you can see we also have a photon model in this book and that we offer, you know, explanations for experiments like the Max Zender experiment. I think that's an important chapter because you know weak measurement experiments have already like undermined the mainstream interpretation of quantum mechanics they show that those linear polarization states might actually be something real and our photon model gives well a logical explanation for that there's a lot of other stuff in the book 
we um, as you can see here we talk a lot about the fine structure constant which basically um, pops up in many equations and you know it comes out of our model also in you know, well basically as a scaling constant and that sort of explains why and how it pops up in all the other contexts how it relates the contour and the Thomson radius for example or electron velocities and energies in atomic orbitals and so on and so on so um, well a lot of, a lot of it is still highly speculative but that, that's why this book is a lot of fun I think it stimulated my thinking and I hope it stimulates yours too if anything this book should should make uh, should help you to think for yourself be part of the movement I'd say think for yourself be a, a renaissance man or a renaissance woman try to understand it all don't take anything for granted this book will at the very least show you what we do understand and what we don't and if you don't think that's valuable then well, just buy one of the standard textbooks um, I would recommend Dirac or Feynman's or whatever definitely do not go for the simplistic the popular literature literature I read those books and they all leave you hungry very hungry I hope you enjoyed this presentation if you're still listening I must assume you do you, you did then um, well thank you very much <laughs>